Hello and welcome to another video. This is lecture five and we are going to start Indo-European origins this week. Uh, there are new readings for this and I'm not entirely sure that these page numbers are accurate, but you wanna make sure that you are reading according to your schedule. I'll also put up the readings for today on your uh, Blackboard. So make sure that you are reading your textbook. Last week, we looked at two new topics. We looked at corpus linguistics and we looked at uh, how the uh, history of writing uh, kind of happened simultaneously with the history of speech. But in today's video, what we are going to be looking at is the origins of the English language. And English as a language uh, sort of originated in the European mainland with the Germanic tribes and the other tribes that kind of invaded uh, Britain in uh, around, say, 8400, 8500. So that's what we are going to be looking at today. So when you look at the history of England, uh, England was invaded by the Celtic tribes and these tribes were Christians and uh, they were in um, England uh, prior to the arrival of the Germanic tribes in 8400 and 8500. And they uh, were also uh, Romanized by the Roman rule. So there was quite an influence of uh, Roman Catholicism and Christianity at the time that the Anglo Saxons arrived and Anglo-Saxons, who are the Anglo-Saxons? So this is a map of uh, Celtic Britain from uh, first century uh, BC. And as you can see, there are a lot of um, main cities that you can see on this map. So for example, Canterbury, London, um, Lindisfarne, Edinburgh, uh, etc., that are going to play a huge role in the history of English as we move along this semester. So who are the Celts? So the Celts are actually ancient Greek travelers and the Romans call them Galli and the Greeks actually call them Keltoi and uh, both uh, Galli and Keltoi actually mean barbarians. So uh, they, were, uh, they were not very liked by uh, say the Romans uh, or the Greeks um, and they were kind of uh, migrant uh, travelers, right? So they would move from one place to the other, they would invade uh, different places, and they're a very old tribe. So they go back all the way up to 2400 uh, BC. And here is another map of ancient Britain. And again, you can see there's a lot more detail in this. This map is not actually, you know, you might want to zoom it and uh, view it because um, it's not very visible. Uh, the, the names are not very visible. But you can see that here, there are divisions, right, according to, okay, England is all in like pink and then um, Scotland is in a different color. Uh, but obviously the, these kind of divisions do not exist at that point, uh, but you know, it, it's kind of color coded to kind of tell you um, how the divisions happen later on in time. So the language that originated before England uh, started having English or English started developing in England, this language is called as Indo-European. And Indo-European is the source of many languages, not just uh, European languages, but also South Asian languages. And the Indo-European languages spread between uh, third and fourth millennium uh, before Christ. So uh, what we call as Indo-European is something that has been reconstructed from known languages that exist today and we have speakers of for today. And what we reconstruct from that language is called as Proto-Indo-European, P-I-E. And what we know of P-I-E is basically, well, the people who spoke Proto-Indo-European had a very advanced culture and their religion was polytheistic. And the language of Proto-Indo-European is actually being reconstructed. So I'm gonna talk about reconstruction in a minute, but it's basically words such as uh, these that actually give us a clue about the origin of Indo-European. Uh, it, it, it's the, the best guess that we have is that Indo-European is spoken in an area between Northern Europe and Southern Russia. So kind of like uh, towards the Mediterranean, uh, but in between that, Europe and uh, Southern Russia belt. So it's words like alder, apple, beech, oak, olive, cypress, that kind of give us an idea that maybe Indo-European was spoken in the Mediterranean uh, belt. 
So here is a map of Europe in 486 AD. And as you can see, you have uh, Europe with uh, Italy. And um, let me see if I can use a laser. Just... So that right there, that's Italy, right? Um, and this is Europe. Uh, sorry, this is uh, Russia. And so the idea is that Proto-Indo-European kind of originated around this area, right? And here is England. That's England right there. Okay. And most of the Germanic Indo-European languages, they originated here, right? And they moved from here to England right there, right? Okay, so so where was it spoken, right? So we kind of have an idea that it was spoken in the Mediterranean region, but it's spoken to be a little bit more specific than that. It's spoken in the Northwest of the Caucasus. What, what is known as a Caucasus uh, is, is that Mediterranean kind of region between Europe and Russia and North of the Caspian Sea. And it was spoken as early as fifth millennium BC. So um, it, it, it's been spoken for a very long period of time. It's been around for a very long period of time and it expanded into the Balkans. Balkans, Iran, and Southern Europe. So here is uh, the probable homeland of uh, in Proto-Indo-European. So as you can see, here is Russia. This is uh, Russia. So that's the Russian border right here, right? And then you have uh, Turkey, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, etc. right here. So this is supposed to be where Proto-Indo-European kind of originated, right? So Russia with borderline of Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Turkey is supposed to be where it originated. Now, how was Proto-Indo-European discovered, right? So it, it wasn't like anybody actually knew that this language kind of existed. Uh, before reconstruction, before the linguistic process of reconstruction happened, and before people really started looking into systematic language change patterns, uh, people actually thought that similarities between languages were just accidental. It just happened arbitrary, just like how we call a dog dog in uh, English and chien in uh, French. It was thought of to be just accident. And some people thought that it was different cultural backgrounds, uh, that, you know, there are some similarities because there is different cultural backgrounds to all these people. And then there are some shared kind of uh, things that exist. Uh, and those are the kind of similarities that you see. And then some people also thought that this was basically the Tower of Babel uh, story that most of you are familiar with, the divine proclamation. Um, so it, very early on, people thought that there were actually no uh, such thing as one common language uh, from which all other languages stemmed on. But then, uh, around the 18th century, when philology was at its height, when um, linguistic tradition started with respect to structural linguistics and um, historical linguistics, people started noticing uh, similar patterns across languages. So these are, um, so we have three languages, so that's Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, and Basque, and I have the word for uh, foot, tooth, and heart in all these three languages. And I want you to notice something similar. And I've color coded this for you, but I want you to go down this way for all these languages. So the Latin word for foot is ped, the Greek word for foot is pod, the Sanskrit word for foot is pud, and the Basque word for foot is oin. Now the the Word for a uh, tooth in Latin is dent, in Greek is odont, and Sanskrit is dunt, and Basque is hagen. Heart in Latin is cord, and Greek is curd, and Sanskrit is hirtse, and in Basque is bichot. Now, what can you tell me about the word for uh, foot in Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit? Now, if you can see, 
the and I'm going to use terminology from Linguistics 315. So if you're still unfamiliar with these terminology, please make it a point to review your material from, uh, say, phonetics and phonology and uh, morphology from 315. So this is a CVC uh, syllable structure. So you have a consonant, you have a vowel, and then you have another consonant. Uh, so it's an onset, a nucleus, and a coda kind of construction. Now, if you look at Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit for the word but, you have the same onset, which is p, right? It's a voiceless bilabial. And then you have the d, right? Which is a, um, a voiced uh, alveolar, right? So d, d, d. So you can see that p and d remain constant. It's only the vowel that actually changes in vowels. I will tell you right now that vowels are completely idiosyncratic in English, in a lot of other languages. So let's keep aside vowels for now, but when you look at the consonants, the onset and the, new, the coda have the same um, consonant, right? Per and then de. But when you look at Basque, you can see that it's completely different, right? So what can you tell me about Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit with respect to Basque? What is common across Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit is basically they originated from one and the same mother language or the parent language. And Basque is what we call as the as a linguistic isolate. Oh, that's not a very great color. Let me look at a darker color. Maybe that one. A Basque is what we call as. My handwriting is not great while using this pen, so I apologize for that. Isolate. Basque is a language isolate or a linguistic isolate because it doesn't have known connections to any other language in the world. But Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, we can trace it back to one common language that it originated from. So this method of finding similarities across languages is what is known as linguistic reconstruction. It's a, it, it's a methodology that was proposed by Sir William Jones in 1786. And he actually found out that these similarities across languages are not accidental. They can be traced back to a common mother tongue. And this hypothesis is known as the Indo-European hypothesis, that Indo-European languages originated from one mother language called the Indo-European or Proto-Indo-European. So this was the language that existed uh, before all these other languages came into being, and it is possible to do historical and linguistic reconstruction. Uh, it's also called as a comparative method because you're literally comparing the words of different languages and kind of figuring out that, okay, look, th there are similarities between them. So here are some reconstructed words uh, from cognates. Cognates are words that are similar across languages. Uh, so these are the languages uh, that have been reconstructed, uh, Proto-Indo-European words. I'm not going to walk you through each of them, but you can pause the video and kind of look at each of these uh, words. These are the Proto-Indo-European words for all these, um, apple, mouse, star, to eat, etc. So here is the Indo-European family of languages. So if you look at all the way here at the uh, top, Let's do red. No, I don't. I want the laser. Okay, so this is a uh, Proto Indo European. Proto Indo European has two branches the Western branch and the Eastern branch. Now, let's look at the Western branch first. Um, so, when you look at the Western branch, oh my goodness. Just give me a minute to move this thing. Just one minute, I'm having um, issues with Zoom. Okay, so you have uh, PIE in the Western branch that goes to Germanic, Italic, Hellenic, and Celtic. And under Germanic, you have the North 
and the west and the east. And it is in the Germanic Western branch that you find English right here, right? So in the PIE, the Western branch under Germanic, in the North, you have Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish, which are completely mutually intelligible with each other. So if you are a Norwegian person going to Sweden uh, and you speak in Norwegian, they can understand you. And then in the Germanic Western tradition, you have German, English, and Dutch. So English's close brothers are German and Dutch, right? So if you want to learn a language which is uh, very similar to English and you don't want to kind of challenge yourself, then German is going to be your best bet, right? And then Germanic East is Gothic. And then in Italic or Italic, you have Latin. And then in the Latin branch, you have French, Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. So you can see how removed English is from, say, French, Spanish, Italian, even though there are similarities. Uh, but, but French, Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese kind of originated from Latin, but English did not, right? That's, that's the main difference. And then the Hellenic branch is Greek, and the Celtic branch is Welsh, Irish Gaelic, and Scots Gaelic. And these are the kind of languages that existed in England prior to the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons, right? So the Gaelic uh, languages that, that are still spoken today in England. And the Proto-Indo-European Eastern branch is Baltic, Slavic, Albanian, Anatolian, Armenian, and Indo-Iranian. In the Baltic branch, you have Latvian and Lithuanian. In the Slavic branch, you have Russian, Czech, and Polish. In the Albanian branch, you have Anatolian, uh, Hittite, Armenian, Indo-Iranian, which is where you see Sanskrit. Um, and then Old Persian, Sanskrit, you have Hindi, Bangla, Gujarati, there are a, lot, a whole lot of languages that are spoken in India. And then in Old Persian is Persian and Kurdish. Now, you can see that this is a huge language family, Proto-Indo-European. Uh, it's one of the largest language families that we have, but it's so interesting because there are all these different branches to it. And then you can see that there are similarities and dissimilarities based on which branch uh, of, of PIE you belong to. All right, so a little bit of language uh, typology over here. Uh, an isolate is a language where you cannot find connections to any other language. So Chinese is an example of an isolating language. Uh, there is no known connections to other languages, but also within the language itself, the morphology is isolating. So you write it independently as independent morphemes. Uh, Turkish is an example of an agglutinative language where you kind of fuse together different morphemes. Um, and again, this is just a review of 315. You should be familiar with these terms by now. Uh, incorporative is a schema kind of languages where you incorporate a noun into a verb or a verb into a noun and form like a complex morpheme. And then inflective are cases like Latin um, and English where you have inflections that signal changes in meaning. So I am eating versus I ate uh, differences in inflection. So uh, not all languages are Indo-European. This is something which a lot of you are familiar with after taking 315. Uh, here are some other examples of languages that are not Indo-European, like the Semitic languages and the Hamitic languages. Uh, Semitic languages are things like Akkadian, Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, Phoenician, and Hamitic languages are Egyptian, Berber, Chadic, and Coptic. Now, Indo-European languages can be classified uh, into two uh, main types of Indo-European languages. I'm not talking about the different classifications of languages, but I'm just talking about how we can divide them on the basis of morphology. And this is into Satum languages and Centum languages. So Satum languages is the word for hundred in this language called Avestan, and Centum languages is the word for hundred in Latin. So centum is a word for 100 in Latin, and satum is a word for 100 in Avastan. And these are the two kind of, lang uh, two kind of um, subdivisions of Indo-European languages. And the differentiation between the two groups is in the development of the Indo-European palatal uh, k, palatal sound k. Now, the palatal sound k was actually a distinct phoneme from the velar k. So there were two different k's in Indo-European. The palatal curve is called k, and then the velar k is just the 
cur, right, from the velum. So here's the palatal cur, like in the word hundred. So kyum tom, kyum tom, and then the wheel are cur, like cru, which is uh, raw flesh or gore. Now, in the Satan languages, which came from Avastan, these were the Indo-European, the Balto-Slavic, the Armenian, the Albanian. The two Kurs remained a separate phoneme. So you had the Kir and the Kur, and they remained as such, two separate phonemes. And later on, this palatal Kir became a sibilant, which is the S. Right, that, that development happened later on in, in the language. And then in the centum languages, which came from Latin, the palatal k, the, the palatal k, it fused into one single phoneme, which is the velar k, right, as in Greek and Welsh, or it shifted to a h in the Germanic group. So the k, it fused together into one phoneme in Greek and Welsh, and it became a h in the Germanic group, such as Old English. So here is another map. Uh, this is the map which is uh, showing you the Indo-European languages. So the Celtic languages spoken obviously in uh, United Kingdom, uh, which originally came from here. So like uh, Northern France, if you will. Um, and then you have Germanic languages spoken in obviously United Kingdom, Ireland, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Austria. And then Romance languages spoken in Portugal, Spain, uh, France, Italy, um, Romania, and then Slavic languages spoken in Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, um, uh, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Bulgaria, um, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, etc. The Baltic languages um, spoken in where is the Baltic languages in the map? We cannot see. I think it's kind of overlapping a little bit with the um, Slavic languages, which is why we cannot literally see. Um, my eyes cannot see a single place which is just Baltic. Oh yeah, sorry, Lithuania and Latvia. That's Baltic right there, which is not overlapping with Russia. Um, and then we have Albanian uh, spoken here in Albania. And then we have Greek spoken in Greek and then Armenian spoken in Armenian and then Iranian spoken in Iran and Indo-Aryan, uh, which is right here, spoken in North India. As you can see, South India, where I come from, speaks Dravidian, which is a different language family, right, which is why only North India is covered in Indo-Aryan. And then the non-Indo-European languages are the ones in uh, gray. So this is a great map to kind of give you an overview of where Indo-European languages are spoken. All right, so this was the first lecture for this week. And in the next lecture video, I will introduce to you the sound systems of Indo-European in detail.